Here's something you probably remember. Ozzy Osbourne bit the head off a live bat. Here's something you probably don't remember. He did this on January 20th, 1982. Here's something almost no one remembers. He did this in Des Moines, Iowa. And the reason you might not remember it is because nothing ever happens in Iowa. It was a saying so common that it might as well have been the state's motto. But in 17 years, that would all change. Despite its prairie and savanna grasslands, an agricultural recession in the 1980s led to Iowa's citizens fleeing for greener pastures and more economic opportunities. Some members of Slipknot lived a few miles away from Des Moines, the capital of Iowa, and some moved in and out of the state. Joy Jordison had this to say of his home state. We were raised in an environment where you had to develop your own sense of individuality. I had 16,000 imaginary friends. I had my own fucking army. Ozzy's antics on that fateful January night got him permabanned from concerts in Iowa. The aging population of the state didn't take kindly to his bizarre ways. Ultimately, that didn't matter. Something far more sinister was brewing. Joey was only six years old when this happened. He didn't get to go to the concert, but he heard about it when he heard his parents outraged by the rocker's savagery. I immediately thought that Ozzy ruled. I knew something was going on with that music, and I had to get my hands on it. I bought his Blizzard of Oz album soon after. Jordison seemed to be christened a special kid. He could remember being born, described being in the womb as a black cell and then looking up in the corner and seeing a tiny window of light. His parents played their part in sitting him in front of the radio rather than the television set. But school was unfortunately a different situation. School always felt like someone had their thumb on me. I got horrible grades. I was really introverted and didn't have many friends. There were only one or two people who I hung out with. I just stayed by my locker with my headphones on and concentrated on my own little universe of music. That would do him good as he started his very first band in elementary school. He actually started out with guitar, but because his friend was apparently total ass on drums, he decided he should play it instead. Then one day, when he was in the fifth grade, his parents got him his first drum set. His parents, and specifically his mom, continued to be the real MVP when one Halloween, she jumped in front of Joey while wearing a kabuki mask and scaring him. So if you never knew why he chose the mask he did, now you do. And when his parents divorced, Joey followed his mom's example of resilience in helping her to take care of his two sisters while she worked. She taught me really good morals. Even though I do a lot of fucked up shit and I play in the most fucked up band in the world, she really did raise me well. When his mom eventually remarried, she and Joey's stepdad opened a funeral parlor where Joey would help out with the cadavers. As a high school freshman, Joey would begin a new band called Avango, but was left frustrated because his bandmates didn't have the same drive as he did. As a result of this, and his neighbor Tim buying a guitar and already mastered Metallica's Master of Puppets, Joey started a new band, Modifidios. After Modifidios stole Avanga's guitarist Jay and picked up bassist Ryan, tragedy struck when Jay fell asleep at the wheel and died in a car crash. He was 16 and he just got his license. He was one of my best friends and I still miss him so much. As heartbreaking as Jay's death was, Modifidios had to keep going. They found a new guitarist named Bruce who was able to book an opening gig for Atomic Opera who were the biggest band in Des Moines at the time. Their guitarist was a guy by the name of Jim Root, who was already a legend in Joey's eyes. Their performance was good, good enough that Bruce bailed from Modifidios to join Atomic Opera. But that wasn't a problem as they found another dude named Craig Jones. But by mid-1992, Joey's neighbor Tim had to leave the band too. Up-and-coming band Inve Catharsis featured Paul Gray, Josh Brainyard and Anders Kolsefni, 
who would all feature on a future incarnation of Slipknot, but it was Josh who came first to replace Tim. And by the end of 1993, Modifidios recorded their first demo, Visceral. It was recorded in Joy's basement and mixed in the living room of one Sean Crayon. Their second demo was titled Modfuscio, and then the two demos were later combined and renamed Scrawl. Jorison entered his junior and senior years of high school with good grades and awards for good behavior, just to stick it to his naysayers. He got a job at a music retailer but then bolted to work at a garage because the music selection was far better. His 10 p.m. to 8 a.m. hours for four nights a week at Sinclair's garage was ideal for him because he got weekends off. But with the rise of death metal in the underground, thrash was on its way out. It was 1995 and Modifidios were no more. Paul Gray invited him to join his new band, Body Pit, which, by the way, is a great name for a band. But Jordison instead picked back up the guitar and played with this band called The Rejects, who had a drug rock sound for a little bit. And as luck would have it, Body Pit wouldn't last long anyway. Virtually all the pieces of the great Iowa band were there. The personnel were there, the energy, the hunger. All that was required was for someone to step up and lead. Sean Crahan got the idea for Slipknot one day when he was dragging his cage-like sculptures out to the driveway in order to spray paint them. Frustrated with the scene, the endless amount of cover bands, and the disillusion of any band who was trying to do something original, Crayon had had enough. This is a direct quote from Jason Arnop's Slipknot biography. Sean and Paul had started a new endeavor named The Pale Ones. Sean was on drums while Anders Kalsefni sang and an ex-body pit guitarist named Donny Steele rifted up. Paul remained determined to get Joey involved with this malevolent new creation. Visiting Sinclair's one night, he repeated his offer. This time, Paul's efforts yielded more results as he caught the drummer at a vulnerable point. Joey, I was lost. I didn't know what the fuck I was going to do. But I told Paul that we should form something completely new and groundbreaking. Joey's ears were pinned back in that rehearsal space as the pale ones burst into action. The song was called Slipknot, ultimately destined to be recorded as Sick three years later. In a greatly improved version, it was nevertheless enough to assault his senses. I remember trying so hard not to smile, so I didn't look like I wanted to join. I remained poker faced, but I thought they ruled. Joey told himself that he would either have to join the band or destroy it. The mission statement of the Pale Ones was simple enough. They played what they wanted, they didn't bow to trends, Joey wanted three drummers, and he suggested that instead of calling themselves the Pale Ones, why not just call the band Slipknot? After a unanimous agreement, Slipknot remained in the incubator, causing quite the stir among the public. Everybody wanted to see the local supergroup playing together, and we never let them see it. We just sat in this basement, getting different kinds of drums and perfecting our art. Everyone knew who was jamming in the band, and they were like, Fuck! Have you heard who's in this band? Everyone had heard about the band, but no one had heard us or seen us. Their very first unofficial show was Halloween 1995, and of course, they had to dress up, adorning their faces with makeup. But that stuck with Joey, who wanted the band to wear masks every show, no doubt inspired by the kabuki mask his mom scared him with all those years ago. Sean took note, they collaborated on the idea, and the only one who didn't like the mask idea was Donnie. This wouldn't be a problem in a few months time. Sean called Mike Lawyer on getting recording time at his studio SR Audio. Mike got Sean in touch with his engineer Sean McMahon who was blown away when he saw the band at their rehearsal. On their very first day of rehearsal, Lawyer walked into the parking lot to see several chalk outlines of presumably dead people. Then he remembered who was booking his studio. Their labor, which would eventually be titled Mate Feed Kill Repeat, took 7 months to finish, 1200 hours, and cost over $30,000, which was largely footed by Sean, pushing him into what McMahon estimated was $40,000 in debt. Such was Clone's appetite for success. The band made SR Audio their home. They hung up pinup chicks, brought porn, chain smoked, 
drilled holes in the wall, and erected their extracurricular art pieces. This was when Clone opted for new percussion by keeping the oil drum and adding beard kegs and garage door opening springs. When the winter of 1995 hit, the band was undeterred. When most people were closing stores and schools and having snow days, Slipknot was still hard at work. Anders picked up Crahan and McMahon, went to the studio, and worked through the night. McMahon recalled one interesting recording session. Joey was having a problem nailing one song, so he took off his clothes and played it naked. Then he nailed it. It was where he needed to be in order to get that power. I don't know what the logic was, but it worked. As for Donnie Steele, he ended up leaving the band due to his religious beliefs and possibly because he didn't quite realize the type of band Slipknot was. I mean, if the Halloween masks, pornography, blood-curdling screams, and homicidal machinations didn't tip him off, I suppose he needed it all at once for it to sink in? But this wasn't a problem as the band simply recruited Craig Jones to fill the void. Slipknot had their proper debut show at Safari on April 4, 1996. Joey said the vibe of the night was crazy and he recounted what his bandmates were wearing. Paul had this wire strung all over his head, through his piercings and through his tongue. Andy had tape strung all over him. Josh had an executioner hood. Craig had stalker type pantyhose over his head, which meant he couldn't even see what he was playing. Sean and I had the masks we always had. From Arnop's Slipknot biography. Then something unnerving happened. Joey Jordison grabbed the microphone and informed the audience, I need a little Christmas in my drink. Then he said it again and again, increasing the volume and intensity of his voice with each repetition. This was him recreating a tradition from his grandfather at Christmas, who would hold up a glass of coke and request a little Christmas, which was a bottle of Jack Daniels. I got maniacal with it. I went ape shit and started screaming. People were losing their minds. I had so much energy that first show that I tripped the whole band out. They had been nervous, but immediately they were all jacked. They were ready to kill. When the feedback and his own ranting had reached fever pitch, Joy moved back to the drum kit and the band slammed into the song, Slipknot. That, Joy still believed in October 2000, was quote, the best feeling I've ever had, end quote. Fun fact, that was 21 days before Joy's 21st birthday. The band's second show was the following night and featured them and Corey Taylor's Stone Sour. Prior to Slipknot's first show, Stone Sour was the premier band in Des Moines. After Slipknot's first show, that wasn't necessarily the case anymore. Sean, ever the promoter, put up thousands of Slipknot posters across town and to heighten the stage performances, had a gelatinous mess of a dead crow in a jar that he would smell, throw up, and then share with the kids at shows. They'd dip their hands in it and even get some on their faces. At this point, Craig moved to sampling and Mick Thompson stepped in for guitar duty. It was Joey who recruited Mick, despite their shared disdain for one another. Me and Mick used to hate each other. We just never knew each other and we thought each other were dicks. To me, Mick just seemed to be about macho shit. Then I got to know him properly. As for the finishing touches on Mate Feed Kill Repeat, the barometer of greatness was Joey's boombox that he played at the garage. The guys would make a test CD, play it through Joey's boombox, and if it sounded good, then it passed. With several different opinions from seven guys, McMahon obviously was overwhelmed, but he got the job done with both mixing and mastering. From Arnold's biography, on Halloween, Mate Feed Kill Repeat was unveiled with a party at, where else, the Safari. People peered intently at the sleeve of the new record, which depicted Joey naked in a metal cage. The cage had been made by Sean, Joey, and Anders. It was a piece entitled, Patiently Awaiting the Jigsaw Flesh, Joey. We took that album sleeve photo in Indianola in minus 30 degree weather. That cage was so rusty, Jesus, I should have had a tetanus jab before I got in there. The cage also became known as the Death Cage and would become part of the band's stage show, with various willing victims sitting inside while they played. 
The made feed kill repeat release party drew 400 people. The attendance blew the band's minds. Joey, it seemed like the height of our careers. We thought it couldn't get any better than that. Later, a battle of the bands pitted Slipknot against none other than Stone Sour. Joey thought they were going to lose, but they won and kept winning throughout the rounds until they won the entire competition. They received a cash prize that was put into more recording. They also got increased interest from record labels, including Roadrunner. Slipknot played in front of 18,000 people at DotFest and totally sucked. They sucked so bad that Clown and Joey got into a screaming match which caused Joey to quit. Obviously that didn't last very long and as soon as Joey and Sean got to talking, they agreed that it was just better for him to come back. However, that day at DotFest was the first but certainly not the last that they had seen of this DJ named Sid Wilson. As was mentioned before, the money they won from the Battle of the Bands went into more recording but this effort was never released. Officially. Kind of. To cut a long story short, Joey coined the term crows and it was all over Slipknot demos until people assumed that crows must have been the secret name of this never released album. As the years wore on, the demos came out, but there was never an official release, there was never an official track list or track order for the project, but you can find it online. Roadrunner were still interested, but they weren't sold on Anders as lead vocalist. After a hundred minute argument about his vocals, Sean and Joey adjourned outside to brainstorm, came back to McMahon and asked him what he thought about getting Corey Taylor to join the band. The dynamic duo went to Taylor's office, a sex shop called Adult Emporium, where he worked the graveyard shift. Taylor was threatened that if he didn't join Slipknot, Joey and Sean would kick his ass. The rest is history. Corey saw it as a great calling card to help him express himself more and to give a voice to the average Des Moines native who was also stuck but had no voice. His first show didn't go so well, not because he was just nervous, but the equipment was fucking up. Joey got some negative voicemails as a result. Some wanted Anders who was still in the band but on percussion duty to be back up front. That was August 22nd, 1997. We all know what happened next. Their next show on September 17 was Bethel. Corey replaced the makeup job from the first show with the mask we all know today with the holes at the top of his head for the dreads to hang out of. However, Corey was upstaged by Anders, who announced on stage and right before they were about to close the show with scissors that this would be his final show. The only one who knew that was coming was Anders. Joey accepted Anders' resignation pretty easily, but noted that Sean had a more difficult time. I remember Sean pacing back and forth, shaking his head as we played the song. I tried to tell him not to let it show. They were really good friends, so for Sean, it went deeper. Chris Fenn entered the fray, and as you're probably well aware, his hazing into the band was pretty bad, but he took it on the chin. The band took to hazing their fans too, as Corey had beaver tail on stage, gifted to him by Clown, and they squeezed the beaver tail juice all over themselves, threw up, and had a laugh. The band also set up televisions showcasing scatology and suicide. They really didn't like being trendy, and they made sure to get rid of anyone who was following trends and following Slipknot as a trend. Slipknot was crushing it though. And their manager at the time, Sophia John, put out a call to John Rees. She wanted a contact for Ross Robinson in the hopes that he would produce Slipknot's next album, not knowing that John Rees managed Ross Robinson. Ross Robinson was already metal royalty after producing damn near half the records and albums you know and love. And I would list them all, I would love to, but we don't have that kind of time. Robinson and Rees met Slipknot on the 1st of February 1998 at Sean Crayon's house. Robinson said, They were all smoking and hanging out. Then, when they saw my car coming, they all ran into the house. That was pretty cool. Slipknot was a band of scrutiny. No one could just enter the basement. But as Jordison put it, 
Ross was the 10th member of Slipknot without even knowing it yet. He was an honorary member. He could come in. They decided to play for Ross, but everyone's nerves showed. Joey counted them in and a stick flew out of his hand. But when Robinson watched the band play unmasked, he couldn't help but think that the masks were an obstacle to seeing the actual facial expressions of each band member. Now obviously he would never change the image, but he loved just how expressive they were. Joey told Metal Update, Ross had a smile on his face from ear to ear. He said, I've been waiting for a band like you guys. On February 2nd, the next day, Robinson saw Slipknot Live, in masks. He said of the event, they barged through the crowd like destructors. Joey was on mixed shoulders, kicking people and hitting them on the back of the head. They were ready to rip the audience apart. Joey felt an immediate link with Ross. He said, we definitely had a connection. There's not many people I feel that much of a connection with. Me and Ross are the same guy. We've been through the exact same things. Stuff happened at the exact same points in our lives. These days, we can pretty much complete each other's sentences. After the show, the band and Ross went to get some food, but Joey and Ross sneaked off to listen to the debut Soulfly album Ross just finished producing. Then Joey gave Ross the new Slipknot windbreaker the band had just got made. As a matter of fact, he gave him his windbreaker. In a matter of days, Ross's manager got in touch with Slipknot's manager and said he wanted to do an album with them. They weren't even signed to a label yet. In February 1998, well, later in February 1998, a blast from the past would reveal itself. Enter Sid Wilson. He was DJing with Soundproof Coalition, told Joey and Sean that he had seen them at DotFest and offered his services if they needed it. Sean gave him his number, Sid drove Sean up a wall, calling him all the time, and then he just let him into the band. Right before a show on March 11, Sid headbutted every member of the band, and when they were playing Tattered and Torn, Sid headbutted Sean 16 times, knocking him down. Ross Robinson signed the band to his I Am record label, which would eventually become an imprint on Roadrunner Records. Slipknot became the first signed band out of Des Moines when they put pen to paper in a tattoo parlor called The Axiom in front of an untold number of journalists. The little 5 foot 3 guy and his best friends were on the verge of superstardom. Ozzy's blood sacrifice all those years ago paved the way for Iowa's most prized export. And they did it by staying true to the vision and true to themselves. When someone constantly tells you to get a real job and quit spending your money on new drum pedals, all that shit circles around in your head. There's a constant hate in me. It never leaves. And it comes out every day. We were degraded for so long and had fingers pointed at us. When you get that middle finger as much as we did, you just want to throw it back in their faces. His co-conspirator, Sean Crahan, had this to say. I'm a big fan of Joey's drumming. There's not a day in practice or during a show that I'm not amazed. There was still one more change to this classic lineup to come, but Slipknot was more than ready for world domination. Thanks for watching.